His eye is on the sparrow. Thank you so much, Kathy. We have Kathy Allen playing for us uh, on this uh, Palm Sunday worship service, and Tracy and Glenn in the back on the soundboard and on the camera. Thank you for all, all for being here. And this is our Palm Sunday worship, and we are doing this online again. And we now know uh, from the events that happened this week and the pronouncements that were made that we are going to be in this uh, lockdown and, and the church is shut down for at least uh, through the entire month of April. And we don't know, we'll see when we get toward the end of April, whether we're able to worship in the early part of May or not. And uh, one of the things I wanted to <clears throat> lift out is that I've been going back and forth for the last couple of weeks. You've heard me in my daily devotions and even in my announcements last week, thinking about the possibility of waiting until we get back together to worship to do Easter. And uh, finally, I came to the decision that, that uh, we don't know when we're going to actually come back together. And so we need to do Easter on Easter. Even though we're going to be celebrating it in our homes, uh, we're going to, next week, we're going to do an Easter worship service with an Easter message uh, in the middle of this. We're going to do that next week. And then when we do come back together, hopefully it's in the early part of May, maybe it's later, but when we do come back together, we're going to have a big celebration. It's going to be a, a wonderful time of celebration when we come back together to worship, but, but it's not going to be Easter. We're going to do Easter next Sunday. And just uh, uh, to let you know, too, we're going to be posting on the website. I'm going to be doing a, a Maundy Thursday ser um, sermon. We're not going to do a whole Maundy Thursday service. That service is often... Um, kind of uh, uh, built around Holy Communion because that was the night when Jesus instituted Holy Communion with his disciples. And since we can't do that, uh, I'm just going to do a sermon for Maundy Thursday, and that'll end up being posted. But we are going to do a Good Friday Tenebrae service where the lights go down, and, and so that'll be posted. That'll be, probably won't be as long as a normal Good Friday service, but it will be a shortened version of the Tenebrae service that we do. And then, of course, there will be the Easter Sunday service, and we'll just keep doing this until uh, we are back together. So that wanted to give you that note. Also, we'll continue to do birthdays and anniversaries. <clears throat> this week, last week I had a whole bunch. This week I don't have so many. We have only two birthdays. Uh, Tom Kloster Jr., who uh, his birthday is Wednesday, the the eighth, April eighth, and then Julie Miller, whose birthday is also this coming Wednesday. So happy birthday to Tom and to Julie. And we have no anniversaries in our congregation this week. So um, if there is a birthday or anniversary that you have that somehow we don't have in our records and you don't hear it mentioned, you can um, uh, give June a call during the week and, and let us know, and uh, we'd be glad to get that on the list as well. We have a number of prayer concerns. I'm going to be reading that list through when, when I do the prayers later in the service. Um, but there were a couple that we've added this week, so I wanted to mention that. This list is going to get really long, so I'll probably, as we've prayed a couple times for people, I'll start to take people off the list if they're no longer a uh, current concern. But um, there's a few we've added. I was just talking to Tracy Brenneman, his uh, brother-in-law. Uh, uh, Kim's uh, sister's husband, Chris Jasker, is uh, um, uh, dealing with some illness, and we want to lift him up in our prayers. We'll put him on the list. Also, uh, we've added Diane Wampler's daughter, Cindy Strader, and uh, so our prayers are with, uh, with Diane Wampler's daughter, Cindy Strader. Uh, a correction from last week, I, I mentioned that the uh, uh, Tom and Joe Kloster's granddaughter is, was, I said last week, was stationed in Iran, which of course is impossible. Uh, she is stationed in Iraq, and, and we want to lift her up at, at this time, and so when I pray for her, I'll correct that and say Iraq. Uh, April Buchanan, who's had some health issues this past week, we, we lift her up this week. Also, Carrie Richardson had some uh, uh, surgery at Perry Hospital this week, so our thoughts and prayers are with her. And then, uh, uh, congratulations, Blake William Olson was born on March 26th uh, to Greg and Lori Olson. Dennis and Wendy Olson are his grandparents, so um, uh, we welcome into the world Blake William Olson. He has an awesome middle name, William. Okay. Uh, I just heard there was one family who had twins and named them Corona and COVID. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but this, this is a great name. Blake William Olson. So, so happy uh, or blessed uh, birth there. And that's all the announcements that I have. 
we are ready to begin our worship, and so I'm going to kneel down and, and have a little opening prayer, and then I'm going to go up to the altar for the confession and forgiveness. Glenn is going to go up to the screen, and you're going you're gonna to be on the screen for a while um, and so that you can follow along at home. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings you've given us in our lives, but during this time uh, uh, of shutdown, when, we, when we're going to be celebrating Holy Week uh, uh, in our homes, we pray that you would bless our time of family worship together. And we pray today, Hosanna, to, in the highest to Jesus, uh, who came into that, to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And may we wave the palms together at home as families in honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We continue now with our confession and forgiveness, and you'll find that confession there on the screen before you. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly wor love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pray together with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. <clears throat> Everlasting God, in your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection. He who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to move over to the lectern now where we're going to do our scripture readings. Our first scripture reading uh, is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50 beginning at verse 4. <clears throat> Isaiah writes, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And of course, that uh, passage from Isaiah is one of several passages which are called the suffering servant passages. And they're, they're predictions by Isaiah about the coming Messiah who would be Jesus. And our second lesson is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the second chapter, beginning at verse 5. And Paul writes these words. Have this mind among yourselves, 
which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, And others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now we're going to invite the children to come for the children's sermon time. And look, they are already here at the altar. Good to see all of you. Good to see Pooh Bear back and the penguin and the cat and the gorilla and all of the others here. And uh, welcome to all of you young people at home who are watching Uh, at home with your families. We're glad that you're here for the children's sermon as well. Now, this is a very special day, and I don't know if any of you uh, who are here at the altar, if you know what special day it is. I heard somebody say it. Palm Sunday? Is that what you sat at home to? Yes, it is Palm Sunday. And maybe you don't know what that name means. Where does Palm Sunday come from? Well, when Jesus came into town just, just a week before Easter on a Sunday, he rode into town on a donkey, and when he rode into town on that doc- donkey, people start, started surrounding him, and they were shouting things to him. They were praising him, Hosanna in the highest, and some of the people cut down branches from palm trees. Now, we don't have palm trees around here. We don't have palm trees. It's a little too cold in Illinois for palm trees. But if you've ever been to Florida or California or Texas or somewhere like that where it's warmer, you might have seen palm trees. Maybe you've seen seen that if you've gone to to Florida. But uh, we don't have palm trees. But what the people did in that day, they cut down palm trees and they started waving them. And other people laid them on the road and they took off their coats and laid them on the road. These were all ways of saying that they believed Jesus was the Messiah that he was the king. Now, if, if you guys could be here today, those of you who are watching on TV, we would have palms for all of you. On Palm Sunday, we always have long palms, and you would be able to wave those palms. But since you're not here, we asked uh, the Sunday school kids if they would send in some palms. And so I've got some palms over here that you sent in. I'm going to show them to you. Here we go. I'll set this up somewhere. Is that good, Glenn? And we have palms here that many of you have, have drawn. And so these are our palms for Palm Sunday today. Some of you put your names on them. I see one from Lucy Adamow. I see one from, from, uh, from Trent down here, Trent Pearson. 
and I don't see names on the other ones, so I can't tell you who, who did them, but you, you probably recognize yours if you sent one of these in. And we're so thankful for you uh, for sending those in. And I've got some of these palm crosses. They're like this. They're made of palms that have been dried out. They're not green anymore. They're, they've dried, but they've been made into crosses. And the next time we come for worship, now, whenever that is, the next time you're able to be here, I'm going to give you these palm crosses because I've got a bunch of them that I want to give to you. And I'll probably have other things by then that I want to give to you too. I'll be giving all kinds of stuff that first day we come back. But here's the palm cross. Thank you for sending in these palms here. And uh, I should tell you, if you want to send us something, uh, a drawing about Easter, if you're at home and you're listening to this and you're thinking, I want to send something that pastor can put up here for Easter, go ahead and do that. Draw the empty tomb or draw um, um, uh, uh, the sunrise on Easter Sunday, something that makes you think about Easter and you can send that to the church or have somebody drop it off at the church this week, and I'd love to put those pictures up for you. Now, I'm going to show you our Bible verse for this week. And if I can flip this, here we go. This is kind of low tech, kind of looks like a ransom note, but, uh, but uh, let's read this together. And it says, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And that's Matthew 21, 9. That's what the people were shouting when Jesus came into town. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Matthew 21, 9. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Jesus who, who is our king, who came into town and the people shouted and called him a king but they didn't know what kind of king he was. He was the king who cared so much about us that he went to the cross and died there for our sins. And we want to thank him for that and thank him for rising from the dead that we might have the promise of eternal life. And we say today to Jesus, Hosanna and amen. Thank you very much. And now as I get ready for my sermon, uh, Kathy is going to play our hymn, and this is a hymn about Palm Sunday called All Glory, Laud, and Honor. The title of my sermon for this Palm Sunday is A Greater King, A Greater King. And the text is that gospel reading that I read earlier from Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 1. And I want to read a couple verses for you again. It says, Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Well, several years ago, I read an interesting magazine article that I ended up cutting out and saving. It was an interview with a man named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, a Russian teacher and author. And because of some of his writings, Solzhenitsyn had gotten into trouble with the government of the old Soviet Union. This was back in the 70s. And he ended up spending several years in Siberian prison camps. And sometime later, he was uh, released, and he was allowed to emigrate to the United States, where he became famous for two books which he wrote about life in those prison camps. One was One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. That's a book that I've read. I think I've got it. I still have it in my, in my office. And the other was The Gulag Archipelago, which a lot of people did read. What I remember most about that magazine interview was a story that Solzhenitsyn told about the Soviet educational system. The Soviet Union understood that the greatest threat to their power was the religious faith of their people. They knew that they could never quite control the hearts and minds of their citizens if those citizens believed that there was an authority higher than the state, namely God. But they also came to realize that they could not stamp out the people's faith in God simply by oppression and persecution. Not that they didn't try, They spent decades arresting and imprisoning and executing people for their religious beliefs. But the persecution only managed to drive the church underground. Many people hid their faith from the authorities, but they didn't give it up. So in the years after World War II, the Soviet government tried a different approach. They would use the educational system as a propaganda tool to undermine religious faith in the minds of their youngest citizens. And um, Solzhenitsyn gave an example of a little game that many teachers used with four- and five-year-olds on their very first day of school. The teacher would begin that first day by asking the children if they would like to have a piece of candy. Now, candy was a rare treat for Soviet children. And so, of course, they all answered with a very enthusiastic yes. And then the teacher would say, well, then close your eyes and bow your heads on your desks and pray to your God for a piece of candy. And the children would follow the instructions. And then after a minute or so, the teacher would say, now open your eyes. And of course, there was no candy. And the children would all be very disappointed. And then the teacher would say, now close your eyes again and bow your heads down on your desks again and pray to the Soviet state for a piece of candy. And while all the little eyes were closed and all the little heads were bowed and all the little children prayed fervently to the state, the teacher would walk around the room and place a piece of candy on each desk. And when the children opened their eyes, their prayers were answered. And as they ate their candy, the teacher would teach them, God does not exist. He is a fairy tale, but the state does exist. I work for the state, and I gave you the candy because only the state can answer your prayers. It was an insidious little piece of manipulation, and it was just the beginning of a whole system of propaganda that was designed to replace faith in God with faith in the Soviet state. Now, I tell you this story because it illustrates a tendency in human nature, a tendency that the Soviet educators were trying to exploit, which is this. By nature, we tend to get more excited about the possibility of physical rewards than we do about the possibility of spiritual blessings. We are at the center of a great conflict between the philosophy of the world and the Word of God. The world tells us that our highest priority should be physical things, the things that we can feel and touch and possess. But the Word of God tells us that our highest priority should be spiritual things, the types of things that you cannot put an earthly value on, things like faith and righteousness and hope and love and forgiveness. And this is the struggle that we all face. Will we spend our lives running after that piece of candy that the world holds in front of us? Or will we believe that there is more value in the promises of God? And this is the question that is at the heart of the Palm Sunday story. When Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem just five days before his death on the cross, he knew what he was planning to do on that coming Friday. He knew what was coming. But he also knew that the crowds of people who would follow him into town on that Sunday, that Palm Sunday, cheering wildly, they all had their own expectations about what he should be doing. 
The title of my sermon, as I mentioned, is A Greater King, because that's what I believe Jesus was. Jesus was greater than any king this world has ever known. And Jesus came to offer us things that are greater than any of the things that any world, worldly king has ever offered. But the Palm Sunday crowd wanted a worldly king. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is, am I on the side of Jesus or am I on the side of that Palm Sunday crowd? Now, before we can answer that question, we have to understand a few things about the story. So let's take a look at the details of Jesus' Palm Sunday ride into Jerusalem. Now, what's really interesting about this whole event is that it was apparently very carefully planned by Jesus. First of all, he, had, he has decided that on this day, he will not walk into Jerusalem, as he probably did every other time that he entered in the city in his life. No, this time he would ride. He and his disciples, uh, of course, did not have an animal, so he had apparently made some prior arrangement to use the donkey of someone who lived near Jerusalem. And on that Sunday morning, Jesus sent two of his disciples into a small village called Bethphage, just east of Jerusalem. There he said that they would find a donkey tied up with her little colt next to her. And they were to untie the two animals and bring them to him. And if anyone tried to stop them, they were to say, the Lord needs them. And the owner would understand that they were for Jesus. Now, why did Jesus need these animals? Matthew tells us in the story, Jesus did this to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Zechariah, who had written almost 500 years before Jesus. He had written these words, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Now the people of Israel knew this prophecy very well. It was a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the one who would be the Savior of Israel. Other prophecies said that when the Messiah came, he would enter Jerusalem from the east, making his way down the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, and through the eastern gate of the city known as the Golden Gate. Jesus knew that as soon as people began to see him descending the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey with a colt trailing behind, they would immediately make the connection this guy has come to claim the title of Messiah. And what would add fuel to the fire was that this day that Jesus had chosen for his grand entrance was the first day of the Passover week. And if you know anything about the Jewish Passover, then you know that it celebrates the story of how Moses, by the power of God, led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And you know that story about how they... They uh, uh, put the blood on the posts and the angel of death passed over the houses of the Israelites. And then God that night led them out of, of Egypt. So Passover was the Jewish freedom celebration. It was kind of like their 4th of July, which was kind of ironic because at that point in their history, they were not free. They were a captive nation under the power of the great Roman Empire. There were Roman soldiers in all of their cities, and, and the Jews were forced to pay taxes to support them. The people of Israel longed for the day when God would finally send his Messiah to deliver them from Rome. And with the beginning of Passover, people were now pouring into the city with thoughts of freedom and revolution in their hearts. And so Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He got on that donkey and he began to make his way down that Mount of Olives, and he might as well have been wearing a big sign that said, I am the Messiah. Because as soon as the crowd saw him, that's exactly what they thought. And the first thing they did was that some of them started to take off their coats, their outer cloaks, and lay them on the road in front of the donkey. This was an old custom in Israel when a king was coming to your town. You would meet him on the road and you would throw down your coats, kind of like rolling out the red carpet. And then some other people got another great idea. They started to cut down palm branches and lay those on the road, or some were waving the palm branches. And this was a powerful symbol in Jesus' day. You see, the palm branch was the symbol of the last free Jewish state during the time of the Hasmonean kings. In fact, the old Hasmonean coins, which some people still kept hidden in their houses, bore the imprint of the palm branch on them. Now, the Romans were very aware of the meaning of the palm branch. 
To wave a palm branch was an act of defiance, like kind of like waving a flag. And then the demonstration got even bigger. Some people began to shout out Old Testament passages about the Messiah. Things like, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem like a king, surrounded by this crowd of people, waving their banners, shouting their slogans, the whole city was stirred up. And people were asking, who is this guy? Other people said, don't you recognize him? This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You know, the guy that does all the miracles. He might be the Messiah. If you had been there that day, you would have thought Jesus was going to turn that town upside down. And the Jewish people certainly thought that he was. And I'm sure that Jesus' disciples were caught up in the hysteria as well. But you and I both know that Jesus did not live up to the expectations of the crowd on that Palm Sunday morning. He did not gather an army that week. He did not overthrow the Romans. He did not set up a new Jewish kingdom in Jerusalem. Instead, five days later, on Good Friday, Jesus was arrested by the Jewish leaders and put on trial before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. And when Pilate offered to release Jesus as a gesture of goodwill during the feast of the Passover, the people wanted nothing to do with him. In their eyes, Jesus was a fake. He was a failure, a colossal disappointment, just another one of the false messiahs. And when Pilate made his offer, they shouted, No, nah, don't release him. Crucify him. How could the crowd who cheered him so wildly on Sunday turn their backs on him just five days later? Well, in the answer to that question, we find our lesson for us today. The answer is revealed in the brief conversation that Jesus had with Pontius Pilate on the morning of Good Friday. When Pilate asked Jesus if he was a king, Jesus said, yes, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. And that statement says it all. The reason that the crowd abandoned Jesus is because the crowd wanted a king for this world. And Jesus did not come to be an earthly king. The crowd wanted a king who would overthrow the Roman Empire, but Jesus had come to overthrow the empire of Satan. The crowd wanted a king who would bring them physical prosperity and political peace, but Jesus had come to bring them forgiveness of sins and peace with God. The crowd wanted a king who would promise them the good life in this world, but Jesus had come to promise them eternal life in the world to come. The crowds were looking for the pieces of candy that the world offers, money and power and pleasure and comfort, but Jesus was offering them a feast at God's table in heaven. But it takes faith to see that what Jesus offers is better than what the world offers. You know, I remember a time a number of years ago when my Aunt Lena was supposed to make a cake for the big bake sale at St. Olaf Lutheran Church, but she completely forgot. And on the morning of the sale, she suddenly remembered, and she looked up at the clock, and it was a quarter to seven, and the cake was supposed to be there at seven. And the worst part was that she forgot to make her cake last year, and the head of the women's group, Helga Larson, was very disappointed in her. So if she didn't get a cake to the church on time this year, Helga was never going to let her live it down. And so suddenly she got an idea. She ran to her closet and she pulled out an old hat box. She took it outside and threw some gravel from the driveway into it to give it some weight. And then she ran inside and set the box on a little aluminum platter. And she got out a can of whipped cream and she sprayed whipped cream all over the hat box and emptied the whole can. And then she spread the whipped cream out so it looked really nice. And she uh, topped it off by sprinkling some pink sugar on top. And then she hopped into the car and she drove like a maniac to the church and she walked into the church basement at one minute to seven and put her creation on the big cake table along the wall. And as she was heading back to the door, Helga spotted her and said to her, I'm glad to see that you made it this year, Lena, but you're cutting it close. And Lena smiled and said, I know, but thank you, Helga. And then she raced out the door and headed home because there was one more part to her plan. When she got home, she dragged her son Hans out of bed and handed him a $20 bill. And she sent, sent him down to the church and she said, you've got to go and buy that cake before anyone else buys it. But to her dismay, Hans came back empty-handed. He said, Mom, the cake was already gone. <laughs> 
Now Lena didn't know what to think. Somebody was going to get a big surprise when they cut into that cake. It was still on her mind two nights later when she went over to Helga's house. Helga was hosting that month's circle Bible study, and when Lena walked into the house, she almost had a heart attack because there in the center of the table was Lena's cake. (laughs) And Lena suddenly felt bad for Helga, even though she and Helga didn't get along really well. She didn't want Helga to be embarrassed by something that she did. And so she she approached Helga. She was going to take her aside, tell her the truth. But just as she came up, someone else came to Helga and complimented her on the beautiful cake she was serving for dessert. And Helga said to her, thank you very much. I made it from scratch this morning. And Lena smiled and walked away. (laughs) Lena's special cake was as phony as the promises of this world. You know, what the world offers us always looks good on the outside, but it's always hollow on the inside. The world says money can buy you happiness, and yet the people who who really believe that never seem to be very happy. They always think they have to have a little bit more. The world tells us that there's nothing more satisfying in this world than than, uh, 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 great sex, great physical pleasure, and yet the people who really believe that never seem to be satisfied. They seem to bounce from relationship to relationship. The world tells us that revenge is sweet, and some of the the people who really believe that are some of the most sour people that I know who walk around in a constant state of spite and anger because they won't forgive. The philosophy of the world is an empty pack of lies. It's a cardboard cake. And that should come as no surprise to the Christian Because the Bible tells us that the author of that philosophy is Satan, the father of lies. And the greatest lie of all is when he tells you that you don't need Jesus Christ in your life. There's a reason why Satan wants you to focus all of your attention on the things of this world. He wants to distract you from the fact that you are going to die someday. And when you die someday, you're going to need something more than what the world offers. I remember when I was in my first church and a tornado swept through east central Illinois. It was just five miles south of Rantoul where where we were living at the time where the tornado came through. And it was on a Sunday evening and one of my members who was a hog farmer was in one of his barns, one of his hog barns. He had just finished giving feed to 400 hogs and he stepped off the foundation of the barn, stepped onto the gravel, and at that very instant, he said, the tornado lifted the shell of that, of that building right off the ground and threw it over his head, and he saw it fly into the field. And he was unhurt, but he was so shaken by the ordeal that he fell to his knees right there, and he gave thanks to God that he was still alive. And then he looked at the pigs. He turned around and looked at the pigs, the walls, in the, outside of their, the walls on the outside of their stalls were all gone. All their stalls were, were open, but not one of them had moved. You know why? Because their food was there. They were so focused on the food that was in front of them, they didn't even notice the building over their heads was gone. Had no idea that they were almost destroyed by a tornado. Had no idea, that, for that matter, that they were only months away from the slaughterhouse. <laughs> The people, when we get so caught up in the things of this world that we forget that we're going to die someday in this world, that this world is only temporary, when we do that, we're no better than those pigs. (laughs) But if we remember that we are mortal, go back to Ash Wednesday when, when Lent started, you know, from dust we were created, to dust you shall return. If we remember that we are mortal, that life in this world does not last forever, then we will never forget Jesus Christ. Because only Jesus can give us what we really need. Only Jesus can give us forgiveness of sins and the promise of salvation. So don't follow the crowd. The crowd is looking for candy. Have some faith and believe that what Jesus is offering is better. Remember that he is a greater king and that whoever believes in him will not perish, but instead will have eternal life in his kingdom. And his kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. Amen and amen. We're going to continue our worship today with our Apostles' Creed. You'll see it on your screens at home. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're now going to, uh, Kathy's going to play two verses of the hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal, and if you'd like to, you can sing along at home. Let us bow our heads for the prayers of the church. And the first prayer that I'm going to pray is one that was written by Sue Scruggs, who is a member of our church's prayer team, prayer committee, and, uh, and Sue wrote this beautiful prayer. And so I'm going to read Sue's prayer first, and then I'm going to uh, finish the prayers myself. <clears throat> Gracious, sovereign Lord, we love you and we need you now more than ever. So much has changed in our daily existence this side of heaven. We miss our routines, our families, and our friends, and we really miss gathering together to worship you. We miss real hugs, handshakes, travel, dining out, and extending family di extended family dinners. Many are out of work and without a paycheck, and we're scared for our economy. Yet, we come to you today with a heart that is grateful and full of joy, because of living hope through Jesus, our Savior. Use this time in all of the earth to cause a great reawakening. May many come to a saving relationship with you because of this trial. Although we are not connected to many of our familiar contacts, we remain connected to you through prayer and through your living word. Guide us through these days. Help us to take advantage of extra time to pray and study our Bibles. Thank you for technology that helps us to share our worship service, prayer requests, and daily devotions. Thank you for Pastor Bill, who is navigating uncharted waters with virtual shepherding. Continue to guide, protect, and bless Bill and Lisa. Please be with those who are lonely, scared, and all that are isolated. Social distancing is not in the Bible, and we want it to be over. We know you are in charge, and help us to completely trust your will and your plan. Use our phone calls, FaceTime, and internet connections to show joy when the secular world feels fear. And we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. We continue with the prayers. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, who is the greater King, who came into this world and and did not come to be an earthly king who could only give us temporary things, but came to die on the cross for our sins and to rise again on Easter Sunday that we might have the promise of eternal life, that we might have eternal things to hope for and heaven to look forward to. Bless us on this Palm Sunday as we, we remember the greater gifts that are offered by Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we pray for all those who who are uh, in special need. And we have many names that I want to read. John Purvis, Lucille Munson, Lynn Swanson, Pat Henning, Carrie Richardson, Ron Wall, Chris Jasker, Azim Hossein and family, 
Jackie Pilcher's daughter, Kim, Shar Morger's daughter, Kathy, Diane Wampler's daughter, Cindy Strader, Ruth Ann Galantine, Dorothy Kerr, the Femrite's son, Mike, who is a firefighter, a first responder, Tom Anderson's sister, Pat, Liz Bird's younger brother, Mary Hull, Susan Loritzen's daughter, Amber, and Tom and Joe Kloster's granddaughter, who is in Iraq. For these and all others, uh, and Father, we include in that April Buchanan, um, who has had some health issues this week, and ask you to bless all of these people whose names have been, have been read here, and all others that we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we give thanks for the birth of a child, Blake William Olson, born on March 26th to Greg and Lori Olson. And we thank you for his, his grandparents, Dennis and Wendy Olson, and we pray that you would bless that whole family as they welcome this new child into this world at a very difficult time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we close by saying, go in peace, serve the Lord, but don't leave your house. And thanks be to God. And we're going to hear Kathy now play, some, play a postlude as we uh, head on out of worship here today.